Hello, everybody, and welcome to Cinema Savvy. Here's myself, George, joined once more by Tate for another entry in the Steven Spielberg retrospective. And and this week, we arrive at the 2011 film, The Adventures of Tintin. Also, his first animated film, uh, which really threw me, even though it's quite abundantly clear this is his first animated film. Um, mm. But before we get into any of that stuff, how are we doing tonight, Tate? Yeah, doing okay. This is an odd film, and I'm really excited to actually talking about this odd film because we go through all of these throughout the retrospective and we always come across those milestones like Spielberg's first war film, Spielberg's first action film. And then you get later on in his career, like we get to his first musical and stuff like that. But this one's this one was an odd one. It was like, wow, he's only done one animated film. Really? He's only done one. And it's like, oh, I, I thought he would have done at least like two or three like throughout his career and then you really look at it and you're like oh okay yeah this is the only one he's done and i'll be honest this is a film where we'll talk about when we get into the review but on release i swear it was so far under the radar like i didn't even know this was out back in 2011 i, I don't know if you did yourself but i've i remember the i obviously didn't see it until now we'll, we'll get into that mm. I remember hearing of Tintin and I recognized the cartoon of his face. I didn't know the context, I didn't know who was who. I know this was a Spielberg film. Hmm. This came out in 2011 and it was around the time, like, obviously, getting to way more. It's scary how we're getting close to like modern day, but um, yeah, we are. <laughs> I'm, I think, if anything, I remember. Well, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get into that because this is a weird yeah, It's going yeah. to be weird to talk about it, but in a nice way. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess what we'll kick start with because this feels like quite a popular film. I was surprised looking at the numbers, which we'll get to later today. But um, I want to hear your thoughts. So please do comment below your thoughts on the adventures of Tintin. And I'll chuck this in there as well. If you have read the French comics or the translations of the comics, you've seen some of the other films attempted in the past, which were apparently terrible. Obviously, all foreign language films as well. The author wasn't impressed, all that sort of stuff. I'm really curious about this because Tintin is definitely a cult film. I know it's made a lot of money, so it's hard to sometimes call those a cult films, but this does mm-hmm. pop up in conversations. So I'm very curious to see what you guys think at home. And as always, please do consider hitting the like button if you've enjoyed this video, if you've enjoyed this series. There's a lot more Steven Spielberg stuff to come. Of course, me and Tate are pre recording this. We are not live. We're doing this on the actual day they've dropped the poster for the Fablemans, which is lovely. Mm. Won't be able to see it though, um, but uh, you know, you never know down the road. So more, more, more on that probably at the end. But as always, Tate, where can the people find us when there is stuff to announce? The people can find us all over the place. We are most active on Twitter and Instagram. That is at cinema underscore savvy. You can also find us on Facebook and Letterbox. Just type in cinema savvy or go on to the link in the description and find us there. Or go on to our Redbubble store where you can pick up a t-shirt, a cap, whatever you like. Um, help support out the channel that way as well. Definitely. So everybody, please do that and get involved. It really does help. So what we'll kickstart, as we always do with this, the IMDb plot synopsis. Um, a, quite an easy one. One that they get genuinely right. Uh, intrepid reporter Tintin and Captain Haddock, set, Captain Haddock sorry, set off on a treasure hunt for a sunken ship commanded by Haddock's ancestor. Quite simple. Um, Very simple. I believe. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it, I, mean, I mean, again, I don't want to like... I mean, this is actually a really good question to you because you're you're bigger in animated films than me. When I say that, you've seen a lot more, but also a lot more by different studios. Whereas yeah. I'm very much the the commercialized route of I've seen all of Pixar, fair few Disney, and like the odd sporadic one. That everyone's like, you've got to see. But my actual animated film knowledge isn't you know a, 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 like it is for a lot of other genres. But what I'm kind of I actually forgot the question I was going to pose to you from that. Um, but what I kind of want to follow is. Immediately, how do you feel if this is an animated film? Because the, the the plan was live action, and yeah. they they did a few tests to get a motion captured dog, which didn't work. And then Peter Jackson confronted, well, not confronted, sorry, he sort of neg- basically convinced them to turn into a, a mocap film. Just how do you feel about motion capture? Because it's one of my favorite technologies, and I don't want to get sad into it, but I'm sort of curious with your background with this too. I think with all technologies that's used for cinema, there is a time and a place for it. Sometimes it fits, it works, sometimes it doesn't. And this film falls into the weird grey area in between. Because hearing that I it could have been a live action film, I probably would have preferred this as a live action film. I know it probably would have come off as maybe a bit more... Ugh, like 
not cartoonish for a live action film, but it would have come off a bit too wacky and a bit like all over the place if it was live action. And it's very difficult when you're adapting a cartoon comic, a very, very popular cartoon comic for that. You've got to get it absolutely right with its adaptation. So you've got to go really close to the source material and it would have been cool to see it in its original style of like animation done that way. Or in this case, they went with mocap. And I mean, the first thing I said to you when I messed you, because this was my first time watching the film, was this feels very uncanny valley. This is like it, yeah. it's it's all there. It looks very shiny and polished, but it just doesn't seem quite right. And I was never able to shake that vibe off this film. All that was running through my head whilst watching this film was this is like a prettier version of the Polar Express a few years down the line. And I don't think mocap technology has fully worked yet for animated films. I can't think of any animated films off the top of my head in recent times where mocap has come in and actually helped it go on. I Wow. This is actually a debate that I was going to say then, but maybe wanted it now. So go for it. <laughs> this wasn't allowed to be considered an animated film at the Oscars. Well, that is um, absolutely outrageous, and I've had my opinions I've, on that in the past, especially with Lego this is, Movie getting disqualified. Well, I, I, I was going for Lion King here because there was yeah. a very famous argument on the channel when the Lion King oh, came out, the, yeah. the new one. And this this is the official description. Hmm. This rule was due to a fundamental misunderstanding of the technology. Whilst motion capture can humanize movements to make them more physically plausible and less demanding on the animation team, assets to render into the scene still need to be constructed. Assets such as character design, backgrounds, objects, textures, hair, fabric, paper, lighting, etc. all have to be filled in, sometimes by hand. Certain movements and clipping often need to be enhanced or corrected with keyframe animation. Now that's yeah. a mouthful. That is me reading off the screen. Hmm. But it, I'm kind of jumping on the, the motion capture here because I said it's one of my favorite technologies. The production of this band began in 04. They said it took yeah. seven years total amongst all this other work. Again, Peter Jackson between Lord of the Rings, King Kong, post Kong as well. It's it's interesting because I'm trying to think. I feel there must have been a 3D animated film using motion capture since, but I can't think of one in my head. So maybe there genuinely hasn't. It's a very expensive technology, and I think. Lion King is that question. Is Lion King live action or animated? Because well, I, I don't. I, I think the answer is no, yes. no one's wrong. No. <laughs> no, I don't think anyone's wrong. No matter what half of the answer you have, because it is fully animated, but it's photorealistic live action, and there were some shots I think of real life stuff in there. You can, I mean, animation has come so far as a medium. You can make animated films now that look so realistic. To the point where it does look like it is real life. Cutscenes as well, my, PlayStation games, yeah. all that sort of stuff. My my personal um like opinion on that is that it's animated. It's it's being physically animated, whether it's done through motion capture or done through framing. It's not like they've got the animals, shall we say, in Lion King to actually do the acting. <laughs> no, it's all being animate like animated over the top of like settings and stuff like that. So um, that's my personal opinion on it, and this film not being nominated through that, I think, is a crime. As much as I didn't actually enjoy this film, getting my opinion out there straight away, it definitely deserved to be nominated for its technological achievements, and I guess for being an outstanding piece of animation of that year. I'm now really interested in what it would have been up against in the 2011 Oscars. And uh, we don't often praise the Golden Globes, but when we do, this one best animated film at the Golden Globes, which just, it is another Lego movie, right? That won it everywhere else, bar, bar this, um, bar the Oscars, not even the nomination. So, after it got recognised. So again, so, we're jumping to the end. Wait a sec. Uh, um, um, that was the year that Rango won. I've still not seen it. That's the so, um, Paul Vodinsky one, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm not sure what else was in that category because Google isn't telling me straight off the bat. But Rango won that year. That's interesting. And this is going to make it interesting because you, you said initially you're not a massive fan, which is fair. Yeah. I mean, I'm the same as you. I hadn't seen this before. My knowledge of Tintin was, again, limited. And I was really curious to this film because it's... I mean, we're just going to talk the writing team very quickly. We're going to go into behind the scenes. We're a bit all over the place tonight, but it's fine. We're going to go into behind the scenes. Yeah. So the writers for this... If you aren't British, you might struggle with at least two of these three names. But we've got Stephen Moffat, Edgar Wright, and Joe Cornish, who all contribute to the screenplay. Now, Stephen Moffat of Doctor Who fame, 
and Sherlock, I believe. Um, yeah. He was writing this, what, and then he was given the showrunner for Doctor Who, I want to say, in the late noughties. So he had to leave the project uh, for Joe Cornish and Edgar Wright to come in and, and pick up the pieces of the script and put it in the right direction. And I kind of thought this, like, when I was reading this, like, again, I, I know it was in the, their names were in the credits yesterday, but if you didn't know it was a British film, by the time you get to the cast, like, I, I'm very curious what you said about the whole, like, I would have loved to see this live action. Because I don't think any of this cast could have played the characters in live action, which also sort of, in it, bar Andy Serkis. I was going to say Andy Serkis and maybe Andy Nick Serkis. Frost. Yeah, it's, playing one of the police it's officers. so... How would you describe it? it? It really demonstrates what you can do with motion capture, and that's what I've always loved is that you can take again. It's like okay, and Circus got them, Kong, whatever roles that you just physically can't do. Yeah, and it's very interesting with this film. But again, having that British background, it's a French comic, of course. Uh, now the behind the scenes to even getting the rights this really surprised me in a really like lovely way. So obviously, because when I was watching this, I didn't know this. This isn't like me like jumping. I was like, oh, there's a bit of like an uncharted Indiana Jones vibe to this film. Obviously, it's hmm. Spielberg, it's an adventure film. But there was this, I mean, if you, I don't know if you've seen the new Uncharted of Tom Holland. This, no. I mean, he's for some reason, he's about 12 on it, which might as well have been Tintin. Um, Mark Warburg playing the dog. Um, it's it's very interesting that the, I can't pronounce the name of the, the, the author, her her J H E R G E, but it's got the apostrophe on the G. Hirsch? French isn't much. Hirsch, let's go with Hirsch. Um, <laughs> so when Raiders came out in 81, Spielberg's assistant bought a box set of all of the comics in French. And he didn't know French, but he, he would look at the comics because he loved the artwork design. And at the time, the author of the comics was a very big fan of Steven Spielberg. And there had been adaptations of this series before. I think it's about 25 stories or something across like eight, nine volumes. And he'd never enjoyed a single adaptation uh, that was done. I believe they're all live action. And um, he believed that Spielberg was the only person that could adapt the source material. Very interesting coming on the back of Indiana Jones. I'm just going to say that's off the back of Indiana Jones and E.T. And they were due to meet on a, on in 1983. And the week they had their meeting scheduled, the author died. Um, yeah. But his assistant slash estate were very... They, they were so in on Spielberg doing it, they still passed over the rights to him to take as a producer to adapt when he wanted to. Which is, you know, it would have been lovely if they'd have met, I guess, or maybe had conversations, but it's basically just got stuck in development hell till the early noughties. And that's when the ideas came through Peter Jackson. As we sort of said, it, it began with live action. Uh, and mm. then the conversation, Peter Jackson turned it into motion capture, which, I mean, we've got to think contextually, because right? you, you you took part in the Peter Jackson retrospective, which went up yeah. to all lovely bones, which actually, this is kind of perfect. This, this is, is technically this is exactly the one the after, yeah. Film. Yeah. Yeah, and um, so he didn't direct this per se, but this is very much like I'd say like a George Lucas Spielberg type thing where like Spielberg yeah. directed it, but like Lucas is there as is Peter Jackson, and it's really interesting having these two collaborate because uh, Peter Jack again I've not seen his old films, but Peter Jackson to me is very much a George Lucas that he has done this trilogy that's so revered in all of the rings, and I won't I mean, even though like personally I'm not the biggest fan of them, there is no doubting the quality of the films, their legacy. Uh, mm. And obviously their status um, amongst amongst last twenty years of filmmaking. What I feel Peter Jackson has done, he's gone down the George Lucas route, and I'm not going to talk about directing like a prequel f- trilogy years later because that 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 comparison has been there for ten years now. But he has pioneered behind the scenes stuff, and Wet Digital was very much his ILM. It's what George Lucas had. I believe he sold it last year for over a bill, and he mm. really pushed motion capture forwards. I mean, just look at Avatar uh, yeah. in 2009. And these two coming together to do this film, it's something that works. That I feel with Peter Jackson as a filmmaker, he is like George Lucas, a, just a fan of films of, of the industry. Why did he do King Kong? Because it was one of his favorite films when he was younger. And there's just something really nice about this. I'm going to sort of hand over to you because I know you took part hmm. in that series and I wasn't. How does this fit in with his other work? Well, this would have come in just after kind of production, kind of release of Lovely Bones as well. Um, yeah. which is, uh, I want to say, a very different film to what um, like he'd done previously. Um, I remember saying on the review, it just feels so far removed from his previous work, and it was a step in a different direction. This feels exactly the same moving on from there. Like, it is, it's unlike any of the other films that he would have done before. 
Um, it, it has that sense of adventure, though, which I guess he would have carried on into like The Hobbit later on and that kind of call to adventure and everything like that, which I guess you only really get a small amount of in Fellowship of the Ring. You don't really get the call to adventure because the adventure is already happening across the other stories within the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Um, but it, it is very different. I do wonder because there was so many different writers coming in and out and because there was Spielberg and um, Peter Jackson both having kind of, you know, their thoughts and say within kind of the process of it all. I do wonder if any of the wires got crossed at any point. Um, because from the start of this film, I felt that it was very chaotic. And that does come from having loads of different writers. It also comes from adapting three different stories into one. It, there's a lot of overlap here. There's a lot going on. And trying to adapt something that is a comic, something that reads off the screen, usually very quickly, maybe like week to week serials, or whether it's just an entire book going all the way through an entire storyline, within comics they tend to go through those elements quite quickly especially when you've got one main character and one sole focus of it it tends to move pretty fast and pretty chaotic and they adapted that onto the screen but i don't know if that could have been toned back a bit i felt like once we get onto the adventure it's fine but the opening 15 20 minutes i don't know if you felt the same at all just felt like what's going on what is happening everything's happening at the same time he's now there what's he doing there oh my god he's now there he's knocked out he's woken up again it's it's all over the place i feel from the very start um i'm kind of i i see where you're coming from i'm not i followed it pretty easy in that sense and i, I don't think why has got across i see where you're coming from because there are some things where it speeds up and there are some things where it slows down mm. the pacing is Sort of, oh. it's like here's Tintin, let's <laughs> introduce him. Here's the boat. People want the boat. Everyone wants the boat. People are dying. This really yeah. grim animated film, <laughs> like 1940s, like Italian mafia style, like doorway shooting. <laughs> um, I, as you come from, what I want to kind of jump on is that Peter Jackson. So he he essentially directed, not directed, but Peter Jackson handled post production. That's sort of very clear that it's his territory. And Spielberg supervised it in the background, checking in. Again, that's not necessarily Spielberg's uh, forte, which is, I think, very yeah. fair. And so, obviously, they worked together on that. But kind of the story I'm with, it feels you've got the the, the franticness of a, an Edgar Wright film with Stephen Moffat, who uh, I don't want to talk about like his later Doctor Who stuff. Like, up, up to 2011, Stephen Moffat, I think it's fair to say. I feel like he is a good storyteller. I feel like he's good at setting up characters. Uh, and at no point it ever delves too much into an Edgar Wright film or, or delves into a Muffet. I feel that like there's like a Spielberg charm that sits through it still. Yeah. Granted, it's a very different charm with it being like computer animated, but it's an interesting one. There's certainly some things that feel a bit off, like the Toby Jones role. I, I'm assuming yeah. that's one of the other th stories, like a really side side point for a is bit it, comic is it relief. Maybe really, really funny that when I saw the cast and I saw Toby Jones's name, I thought, oh god, he's going to be the villain, isn't he? Like straight yeah, away. Yeah, and it was Daniel <laughs> Craig. I was that like, surprised me as well. That really shocked me. I was like, oh, that's not Toby Jones's voice. <laughs> yeah. He's clearly a villain from the start. And it's like, oh, that ain't Toby Jones. <laughs> it's like, oh, look, Daniel Craig, like, no, you can't do it in real life, mate. You, you probably could grow a beard, but you wouldn't be allowed to with Bond, mate. Um, <laughs> but no, it is it, it is really interesting. And um, what we're kind of moving to, actually, you, you mentioned some of it. I, I want to ask your thoughts on, because this is a really hard question. Yeah. Thoughts on direction. Now it's very the, the direct looking at direction again. We're twenty seven episodes into the series now. Yeah, with it being his first animated film, direction animated films are so completely different to live action. To me, it's like almost impossible to compare. Which is why there is very very few directors that can do both. The only, if I'm being honest, immediate success is Brad Bird that I can think of. Travis who, Knight. Yes, he's made the jump of Bumblebee and he's got a few more films coming out. And this is it. And it's it's a very... Because what I feel, and this is maybe a comment on animation. Oh, I guess there's a lot uh, of, the, the obvious one, Tim Burton. Yeah. But has he ever done mm. like computer animated? No. Animated, <laughs> if that makes sense. I know obviously he's done like... He's done like... Um, um, not stop Motion. motion. Uh, stop Motion. But no, that's a very good one, of course. And his style is what I think is perfect for it. And Mm. Where I kind of feel Spielberg's direction on this, it's it's 
it's hard to talk about the direction, so I'm not going to pretend I know for animated stuff. But watching this, I feel it is a Steven Spielberg film. Albeit, a, it's like if Steven Spielberg did a British film. That's kind of the vibe I have. Even though obviously yeah. it's like a European comic. But I I feel the intention was there with the technology. I feel that the tech is there for it to push on with. And again, we'll get to sequels at the end. Because um, I think it, when, when slash if the next two happen, they will look very different in a very good way. Um, unless they really want to stick to this style, but I th- some something feels missing whilst it feels complete at the same time. Is that a weird sentence? I don't think I've ever no. Seen that um, I mean, I I said pretty much immediately that I found this film very chaotic from the start. There are some amazing and beautiful moments where you look at it and you go, "Wow, that is Spielberg direct." I think the one moment that stands out for me that is like a really nice directed moment is just the being on the sands in the desert and then the ship comes through and that transition everything like that um his imagination coming forward for that is just pure spielberg magic straight away right there the corks gun machine gun stuff as well the corks were fantastic as well i really like that but there are other moments where i feel like it just felt not Spielberg like I don't know if he was testing things out because you can do a lot more with animation than you can't do with normal cinema um but like I'd say the crane battle at the end felt very just completely off I'll be honest like it, the ending's very sudden that's what I yeah. felt um because I love I mean we'll get to characters shortly but I love mm-hmm. love love the character acts in the film but the yeah. ending's like car Boom. house credits done. I'm like, oh, like okay, I don't need yeah. an extended like epilogue or you know to set up sequels. But it felt like, oh, that's it. Like we're missing like three or four minutes extra. I feel um, there was but something there was as you said. I mean, even like even the yeah. the animated tank. I mean, cause to me, the purpose of animation is to do what you can't do in live action with normal um, film. Yeah, which is sort of hypocritical, right? Actually, this is a really good question. Mm-hmm. Um, we're pre-recording this the day before Pinocchio comes out. Yes. Um, there'll probably be a Pinocchio review maybe at some point on the channel, but uh, that's another one of the whole let's live action this animated mm-hmm. stuff. And when I say Pinocchio, we're talking about the um, the, the Disney version directed the by Robert Zemeckis, who yeah, yeah, Polar Express, and mm-hmm. uh, and obviously we've got the Guillermo one coming at London Film Festival, the one everyone's looking forward to this stop motion, um, which is really yeah. interesting little plug for that, but. I'm kind of inside that some of the stuff again, like you get this great, even like one of my favorite shots in this is the birds, the the hawk when it's trying to grab the papers. Yeah. And we're following the dog and all that stuff feels very whimsical, very like again, Spielberg couldn't do this in a camera. It's, it's probably impossible. And then we just so get some really. Animation, yeah. Yeah. And one sort of thing, uh, I can't remember, if, I think I did take you there when we were in London. If anyone's been, please comment the Noble Collection Shop. Mm. Uh, they're like a Warner Brothers company, which is an irony that in the downstairs section they've got loads of props. Some are like ones to buy, some are like from films. They have the ship from Tintin, mm. and this is uh, that's just as this is all a new host film. There's a ship in this film because I've seen it at the Noble Collection every time I've been in for like three, four years since it's opened, five years maybe. And I was curious about this ship, and it played an amazing part. I'm like, did they make the ship on set, scan it into the film? Like, I'm really curious about some of that, but. Again, with the direction, I can't. I think the problems may be more the story than the direction, if I'm being honest. But again, as you said, it feels very quick and chaotic. But at the same time, I wouldn't say it was one of his best directed films. No, no, no. no. And if we're comparing it to other directors having an attempt at kind of, you know, doing animated films, I wouldn't even say it was a like a top notch attempt. I agree. It should have been nominated for. Um, best animated feature. I've now looked at the list of things that were nominated that year. You've got Rango that ended up winning it, which is a fantastic animated film. And then you've got A Cat in Paris I've not actually heard of. Chico and Rita I have heard of. That's meant to be quite good. Kung Fu Panda 2 and Puss in Boots. This absolutely could have and should have been nominated for this year. Absolutely. And having a name like Spielberg in there, who knows? It could have won just off name alone, right? That's how animated feature... Is that is that one of the rare years that a Disney film doesn't win? That as is... Well. That's the, that was the last time before... Spider-Verse. Uh, I want to say Spider-Verse. Yeah. 
That's interesting. Talking down this, yeah, Spider Verse, and then yeah, and, and then it's probably Spider Verse Two. Um, and yeah. after the year after next, I mean, let, let's talk some characters because we, we spoke about some of the the sort of structure. Um, I want to come to you about Tintin. So originally it wasn't going to be Jamie Bell, which sort of surprised me. Uh, I can never pronounce his name uh, from Nanny McPhee and Game of Thrones. Um, oh, the um, one that doesn't age. Oh my it's god! Got, it's got it like is double double sangster, barrel. Thomas Brooding Sangster. That's it. Yeah. Um, I think he'd have been. I mean, I say he would have been wonderful as Tintin because it's motion capture. Obviously, they've got to act and perform. But the final yeah. product's never going to look like them. I thought Jamie Bell was fine, if I'm being honest. Um, I've not got a problem with him. I think it's before he's probably at the stature he's at now that he's in that in between period of. Um, oh god, was it about a boy? What's the Hugh Grant one? Um, Jamie Bell wasn't. In a no, Jamie Bell's or, Billy Elliot. Sorry, Billy Bo- yeah, he was Billy Elliot. So I think, and now obviously he's done a lot more TV and film stuff. This is that like in between film. And I said, I think he's all right. I've not got a problem with him. Again, it's harder motion capture, but the problem is he's doing a motion oh. capture film next to Andy Serkis, who is the calling him that the king of motion well, capture is like understatement. Of the century, here's the he thing: was. he was in King Kong with Andy Serkis. As a character oh, who was very close shit, and interacted even... with Andy Serkis, I'd forgotten the that director, the director of King Kong is, it... is of course Peter Jackson. So um, I'm wondering if that was the connection there, and that's, that's what was brought on board because Captain Haddock's character Andy Serkis is a very similar styled character that's played yeah. with a lot more booze thrown in, obviously because Scot- of Scottish that. alcoholic. Exactly, and that's the character that comes in, and Tintin's also kind of like the. The youngster adventurer, which is kind of like his Jamie Bell's character in King Kong, so it, it does kind of come full circle in that sense. Um, but yeah, it did come out of a weird time in his career. He'd just done Jumper before this film came out as well, starring Hayden Christensen. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't before he kind of, you know, dare I say, he became a bigger star after doing Fan Stick and then went on yeah. to do extra kind of stuff after that. Um, film stars don't die in Liverpool is the one. Ah, oh, the basically there were Bond rumors because he was at a meal with Barbara Broccoli, but it's because they did that film together, so he obviously appeared at her like celebration to be a yeah. fine meal. But um, he's he's sometimes in the the rumor mill for Bond. So I, I don't see it personally. He is. I think he's a fantastic actor. Um, I personally don't see it. I, he's got too much of a baby face even now. Like you shave him and he he will look so young again. Um. Tinsley. Yeah, well, not quite like Tintin because Tintin's got the massive round head, um, which I'll be honest, put me off every single time looking at his character. <laughs> All of the other characters look fine. It's just Tintin's. I know it's his character design from the comics, but it's very difficult to get past a really, really like round, stubby face that's staring at you, um, especially when you've got Captain Haddock, who actually looks somewhat kind of more realistic um, next to him. But I thought the characters played it fine. Um, yeah. I think I think it's less on how they played it and more on kind of the lines and delivery that they were given to do for it because I think they played their characters perfectly well. Um, you could easily see Andy Serkis as Captain Haddock. Maybe you could have asked a... And this is my other gripe, which I have with modern animation. Um, the whole getting in celebrity actors to play different voices instead of getting voice yeah. actors who would do a much better job at it. Um, some people managed to get away with it. Um, I think Robin Williams started the trend with the genie, and since then we've been stuck with, um, you know, Chris Pratt being, you know, put forward as Mario. Mario. Uh, yeah, and Charlie Day as Luigi. So <laughs> that's that's what it's come round to. Like, what's it? Um, Lot Key and Peel, um, Keegan Michael Key playing Toad and stuff like that. It's no. Get an actual voice actor. People who have done their career, done their craft. There's still chances in the kind of TV realm for animated characters, but it seems like film, especially with this one, they've gone and picked just celebrities to draw in the film and stuff like that where it isn't needed. And the biggest crime of that is Daniel Craig, who honestly, I barely recognised it was him. You could have picked absolutely anyone to be his character role and it wouldn't have made an absolute difference at all. What I've been trying to do, which I'm really struggling with, is um, I've got a load of behind-the-scenes photos up. So mm. everyone on set played their behind-the-scenes role uh, in the full motion capture costume, the dots on the face, all of it. 
The only one I'm struggling to find photos of is Daniel Craig. Now, I'm not going to sit there and say he didn't do it. I'm sure he would have. Because to be fair to Craig's credit, as an actor, obviously you can say what about his Bond portrayal, performances, yeah. what he thinks the franchise, etc., etc., etc. He certainly has enjoyed playing very different roles in between. And I feel that Craig in this, on paper, you can be a completely different character that's not James Bond and you still get to maintain your like Bond appearance and we do the rest. Yeah. It was so far from Daniel Craig in the sense of, you know, again, like Tintin, I guess, because it's a comic character, right? You've got to follow that comic and you've got to essentially, you can't really change him. And Captain Haddock just is a perfect character. It's Andy Serkis and he naturally actually looks a bit like him in a very like weird way. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas Daniel Craig, I really like, I was why like, did oh, he that's look Daniel so... Craig's what? voice. It's, it's, he looks it's so... just that. It's like, why on earth did his character look like Scrooge? Like, if you had told yeah. me to draw someone who looked like Scrooge or, like, point to a picture of Scrooge, I would have pointed immediately at um, Red Rackham's character in this. It's it's like... It's... Uh, it's, it's weird, because yeah. I'm going to be blunt. His character is the least fleshed out. He, he pops up, yeah. and it's so obvious, okay, this is the villain of the film. Uh, it's Daniel Craig because you've just cast Bond in this like leading support leading role. role. Yeah. A man, a man that wants to get the same ship you have too. So I, I mean, he's worked. Uh, to be fair, he's worked with Spielberg before. So and that's why I was going to say we did Munich recently, which yeah. I think Craig was one of the standouts in that film. And I actually kind of you know on a Daniel Craig side piece because the week of this video going up is the 60th anniversary of James Bond, which is actually like just a coincidence. Um, I think me and you are both fans. Of, I mean, I know he's. I'm always in the minority. Like he's my second favorite Bond after Brosnan. I know a lot of that will probably be because I've grown up, you know, 16 years with him as Bond. But I'm really excited for the roles he does post Bond, and I feel that we've had inklings of it throughout his career. Like, oh, he had just enough time to do Knives Out before No Time mm. to Die shot, or um, oh god, what was the Adam Driver one? Um, the, Logan the Lucky. racing one. Logan Lucky. He was able to take on these roles that are nothing to what he's been. And I don't think he's been typecast as James Bond either. I think, of course, a Bond actor will always be known for playing James Bond. But what I feel is that Daniel Craig, and I'm not to disrespect the other Bond actors, I think he has enough variety and enough ability as an actor to come out on the other side of James Bond. And, I mean, he's just done Macbeth on stage in New York, which was meant to be very good. And a lot of people are hoping he gets a a move to London for a few weeks, you know, how, whenever that will be. Yeah. I'm excited to see the roles he does now because he's got the freedom of not having to, not, not stay in shape, sounds really fair, but when you cast as James Bond, you have to almost like drop everything at a whim. When yeah, the Bond like schedule every, comes. The rest, of the, stuff, the rest of the stuff in your career just doesn't really, like, especially at the time. Everything you do has to be around, if Eon say, this is the scheduled filming date, you can't take a film that's going to clash. So no time stay getting his first well his first major delay meant he could do knives out. Mm. Now, knives out is is like I mean his most the most lucrative role we can say that based on the Netflix deal for the second and third one but I can't imagine a non Daniel Craig now knives out because he made it his no. own instantly and you could tell he was enjoying it and I think as an actor I really enjoy him this is unfortunately one of the roles where I don't think he got the chance to do so but then no. again what was it a scheduling thing? You know, was or it was it just character? I know this is meant to be based off of like a comic book uh, or sorry, a, a novel and stuff like that. But the big question is like, is it just the source material? And it was just like, like a, uh, you can't sham- really adapt a small kind of villain role and stuff like yeah. that. Like, and it's such a two dimensional character that he can't really do much and. You can't build on it to be like, I'm going to be a good guy and betray you. That would be too obvious that it's Daniel Craig yeah. as well. So it's it's one of them where I think they're sort of backed up into a corner where they can't really do anything. And I think because the design looks nothing like Daniel Craig, that actually, that associates him more with it, if that makes sense. that Because you can just hear Daniel Craig's voice, but you can't see him. I can see Andy Serkis in that character. I just can't see Daniel Craig in his. And again, yeah. that's not Daniel Craig's fault. Is that due to them acting in cartoon? I don't know, but it's it's a very weird. It, it's like one of those action films where like you're so focused on the the protagonists that you, you the antagonist you lose that sense. It's like a not like a Marvel film. That sounds very really disrespectful because I hate comparison to Marvel now. But you know, there's like early Marvel films like it was so set up for the heroes and supporting characters that you just miss the villains doing anything. I felt yeah. like that. 
and also ultimately this is an animated film because you're not going to get a layered complex villain I just think that Daniel Craig well, deserves better and hey I'd love to see him pop up in another Spielberg film if they can ever get it allowed well, what's um, really really interesting just um, from doing a tiny tiny bit of research on just Tintin in general the books are based around adventure and mystery. There isn't. There's maybe some little kind of side villains and stuff like that. There isn't really any kind of like mystery. Big old villains. Like there isn't any villains that really kind of stand out or anything like that. You'll get a villain come through every now and then and stuff like that and pose a bigger threat. But it's not like a legacy villain to like a cartoon or anything like that. It's not like you've got a Dick Dastardly um, kind of sitting in the shadows and stuff like that. It's it's just a sense of adventure, and that's really what the entire stories are all about. It probably worked very well with their sequels coming up, um, with the same trends that Pixar and Disney have gone down in recent years, with not really having a main central antagonist to the story, and just focusing on the main characters and their struggles throughout, and their sense of mystery and adventure being the driving force of the plot, instead of having to be up against a villain. Um Maybe it'll work better off that now that they've got kind of one of the only villains out of the way. Who knows? Yeah, and we'll get to the sequels then because I think it is a very interesting sort of potential next step. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, Nick Frost and Simon Pegg's in this. I don't have much to say on them, if I'm being honest. I'm it's, guessing. Oh, okay. Edgar you've Wright got Joe like, Cornish yeah, and Edgar Wright. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also at the time, you know, oh, look, you know, these are the guys that did. The Spielberg had a cameo in Paul, didn't he? I can't remember if this yeah. was just after Paul came out or before, but they'd have. And let's be blunt, like Peg and Frost are yeah. like they're almost like British. They're like a double act that this sounds disrespectful. It's not intended to. They're a double act that haven't actually been a double act for us anywhere near as long as people think. That they're, no. they're such. Like, I guess their early films are so iconic. I don't know if they've done a film since the world ends together. Um, um, I would need to double check that. I could be wrong. I don't but obviously, know they're that. still very good friends. But it's not like a, I don't want to compare it to Antidote. That's embarrassing. But they don't like do a film with each other like Lauren and Hyde like every week or something. It's it is one thing that it's a very like naughty's British thing. I, I view them. So that's really interesting. They've only done one, two, three, four, five, six films together. They've only done six films together. Full stop. And spaced as well, I guess. So that is World's End, Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, Paul. Adventures of Tintin and Slaughterhouse Rules. That's it. That's the six. Interesting. Maybe there'll be more in the future. Who knows? But it, it is interesting. Again, they pop up in this and as like British people, like we 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 know and love them. But I actually, not gonna lie, I didn't realize it was yeah. them until tonight doing the research. No. Um, <laughs> let's talk John Williams though, um, yeah. because this was also this surprised me more than Spielberg. This is John Williams' first animated film. Um, well, that, that really shocked me. Out of all of yeah, the things on this film, his like, first kind of animated score. I don't know how many scores he's done. I'm going to say at least a hundred. That's an insult. I yeah. should probably know. But his first animated film, like for somebody that's musical, is like so sort of whimsical. Mm. I'm really surprised that he'd never been in for like a Pixar film or something. That it's John Williams, like. But then again, like Michael Giacchino is almost like the next John Williams, and is basically his mm. own Pixar in his own right. But I thought his score was fine. It's not one I noticed as much on the first viewing. It might be one I noticed more down the line. Mm. But again, it fits in that Spielberg vibe that you're on an adventure. You've got John Williams in the score. Now, the opening credits, I think it was probably the best part of the score. Yeah. Um, but I, I can't tell you much outside of that. I think it's fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just, again, it his quality's at a level that's unparalleled. And if you don't notice John Williams' score, there's a good chance it's still better than nice and the stuff that you'd be watching. It's just that it's a John Williams score still. Is that me being harsh? Um, Not really. I, I wouldn't say, like, completely. Um, I quite like the score, especially the opening credits. I think that may have been one of my highlights to the film itself. Um, it's very difficult to compare now because I've seen War Horse, which the yeah. score for that film is just... Oh my god, it's just unbelievably good. And one of the things that I've also just found out is that this film came out the same year as War Horse. Like no. <laughs> he he likes doing this, doesn't he? He likes smashing them out together yeah, yeah. at the same time and stuff like that. Um it's sort of like once, the, the blockbuster. Probably, I would say this film's post-production was probably in for quite a while, especially with the animation yeah. suite and stuff like that. He's already said, Yep, yeah, this is exactly what I want. Okay, go off and do your work and stuff like that. 
do your magic. But yeah, I think the score was actually quite underrated. I really enjoyed um, just the different settings, the different styles of music that clash and stuff like that. I found it very bombastic in some moments. I, I think overall it was quite it was quite a good score. Well, here's the thing for you. This film came out in October 2011 and War of yeah. December. But obviously this would have had... Yeah. I mean, it took seven years to make. It shot in 2008 and it came out in 11. Yeah. So I'd imagine there was a lot of stuff done in advance. We'll talk about War Horse production next week. Yeah. <laughs> that's going to be, that's going to, I can't wait for, I've only seen that film once and that's going to be very exciting. Yeah. To do. That's going to be a very um, interesting review, I think. But moving from the score, which again, mm-hmm. we love Mr. Williams and we get to talk about it next week. Let's talk about this. So when it came out, we just mentioned its release date, two Spielberg films and two of that's pretty extraordinary. Um, it grossed three hundred seventy-three million off a hundred thirty-five mil budget, which is actually, again, I think that's for an okay. animated film, that's it's not too bad. Yes, it's adapting a famous like French comic. Was was all of the, not, on, was all of that money made in France? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not. What would you say? Like a French? It is a franchise to a point. It's but it's not. So that's not like a. That's a more than diffi- I thought it would be. I think the big difficulty for me was when i grew up i was kind of not given the choice but it's one of those things where which french comic do you read do you read tintin or asterix and i always read asterix so i don't read either sorry i only knew, I only knew that <laughs> Pino and dandy you, um, you, you don't read french comics george no <laughs> i'm in a cultured swine <laughs> <laughs> but this 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 is it and it's it is interesting that, again like an american like the american director or directors to take Does on a british that. film about a french comic set not yeah. even really fully in britain it's like it's like most like of the it time works. it's set in like sub-saharan africa and stuff like that so yeah and i just there's something about it that works but um going back to the sort of its, it's impact at the time so it did very well at the box office it did well with critics got an oscar nomination mm-hmm. for, for best for best score john williams of course of course not the animated stuff which we've gone over What's really interesting in this is I, I sort of alluded at the beginning. I see this brought up a lot. It's very much in that conversation of what film hasn't had a sequel that deserves one. They always bring up Tintin these days. I reading the the sequel is for this is insane. So this isn't like when I say this is stuck in development hell. This is like Jurassic World development hell. Like they are legitimately trying to make this, but nobody can. Yeah. And there has been updates like every other year. Spielberg to direct it. Peter Jackson spoke about it loads. Joe Cornish spoke about it loads. Spielberg spoke about it loads. The last update was in 2018. Where they said, we believe this film will be in production within three years. Now, obviously, we've had a pandemic in that time. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, Spielberg, you know, actually, this is a fantastic question. We don't know what his next film is after Fablemans. Um, which, at the time of this video coming out, Fablemans would have premiered, I think, um, uh, Toronto. And mm. essentially tell you right, obviously it's not going to be at London Film Festival. But this is, you know, interesting that would he go and do a sequel to Tintin? Maybe. I'm not going to speculate. I don't really want to. But it's really interesting that for a sequel film, you know, there's a lot that's been reported to it. That yeah. apparently like Peter Jackson obviously wants to stay in production. Of course, Peter Jackson is more, in, this is like a George Lucas now. He's not. I don't say it's first about directing because that's really like unfair, but he very much enjoys that behind the scenes stuff. Um, and obviously Spielberg has sort of gone record saying, you know, as soon as Jackson's involved, I'll be involved. Yeah. I think they said it takes about two years to fully animate the film. That's not um that's not obviously including filming, that's not including script writing process. Joe Cornish is working on the second oh god, Attack the Block film, which is finally yeah. going to get a sequel. Um so my question to you is, do you actually think we'll get a Tintin 2? By the way, like, Jamie Bell says he wants to do it still. Circus has said the same. Like, the cast are in as well. I am unsure. Because it's been in development hell for so long, sometimes films just do not get out. And if there's one person to take it out of there, it will be Spielberg. But yeah. he's probably got bigger projects on his mind, dare I say. Like, he's probably got bigger things on his horizon than a Tintin sequel. I, I I could easily see a different director picking it up. I don't know whether they would still collaborate with it and um, himself being an executive producer. There are so many different animation studios out there right now that would be able to go forward and be able to make that um, without having to use their own resources um, like they did in this film. It, it's, it's a difficult one. It really is. I mean, 
as much as I say, like, I, I wasn't the biggest fan of this film, it is nice seeing kind of a different studio other than Disney and, you know, yeah. Pixar and Sony and, oh, God, Illumination Animations, just anyone else other than them um, making an animated film. And it's a different style of animated film as well. We do get a bit of stop motion coming out nowadays. Um, we've got the lovely stuff that Cartoon Saloon are doing at the moment with their use of mythology to be able to kind of like frame the scenes and everything like that. So it's nice to have something else, another option in there to go to. So I probably would say, yeah, I would like to see a sequel to this film, which is weird saying that to a film that I wasn't too keen on. But that's purely because they've managed to set themselves a good grounding for the universe. They've managed to kind of stick out as far as the animation is concerned. And yeah, they've got the people forward for it. It's, it's, it's a Spielberg film. Of course, they could probably go ahead and do it. So why don't they just go and do it kind of things? And I think motion capture now is probably not even... even. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you this. If I was to bet on a sequel, I'll bet you Andy Serkis directs it. Because I know he's moved in his direction. Ooh, yeah, that's a good shout, actually. That's uh, a very know, good shout. I know he's got a lot of projects. He's got a lot of projects lined up and all that sort of stuff. But he runs his own motion capture studio now, which is incredible in its mm. own right. And obviously, Weta was sold by Peter Jackson last year. I'd imagine he's still, you know, like George Lucas, say, if I want to do something, they'll let me do it. Mm. Like meeting all the rings, the Hobbit, King Kong, Godzilla, and Tintin. Tintin was like lovely thrown in there in the corner, and it was like, okay, like this sounds very weird because it's an observation. But it's like he must very much have not enjoyed the role, but that's one's autograph desk. That's obviously a role he's very proud of and has a following. Um, yeah, and kind of moving on from that, let's before we get to final thoughts, I want to ask: Do you have a favorite scene? It's a very. I've got one. But it's more of a sequence than a scene. I loved it when they're first on the boat when he meets Captain Haddock for the first time and they go that's, like yeah, that's that's very like spiel based. Like we we've got to escape the boat. It's like a PlayStation game. Um, yeah. but I enjoyed that that sort of 10, 15 minute window. I think that was when it was at its best in terms of being an adventure. I quite like the flashbacks. Starting off in the desert with that amazing shot, like I've mentioned earlier, and then just kind of looking into the history of Haddock's family and the actual mystery behind it. Um, I thought it was just very well kind of told and dare I say animated during those scenes as well. Um, so that would be a standout scene for myself. And also, of course, the opening title sequence I really enjoyed as well. Um, it, it just kind of it, it made the film feel a lot cuter just from the offset straight away. So I really enjoyed that. No, definitely. I think, yeah, the title sequence are lovely. We spoke on, I know you won't catch them if you can, but that was like his first yeah. like animated title sequence, which was really random. Yeah. Um, but it's nice to get it again with this one. And um, kind of moving on from those, final thoughts. Weird on me, because I, I enjoyed this film. I probably will see it again one day. Um, I don't know when, but, you know. If they, I, if I they make a sequel, like then, yeah. <laughs> yes. No, certainly. If they did a sequel, I'd 100% go back to it. Um, but for me, I think, as I said, I've said a lot tonight, it's a bit boring. I always speak on motion capture. I think there would have been Avatar review out by the time the video goes up to for the re release. Motion capture is like my favorite technology. I've done like modules on it at university for studying, even boring. And like when I spoke to Andy Circus, we honestly just spoke about motion capture for like three, three four minutes because he was like really interested in studying it as well. I loved seeing the behind the scenes, the creative side of this film, what they were like developing, like ray tracing, like pushing that tech forward, which is such a big thing in the industry for like gaming today. Mm -hmm. From a technical standpoint, this is probably one of the best animated films I've seen. From a story standpoint, I'm not as in love with it as everybody else. And what I obviously would be curious is that for those that have read the Tintin comics or whatnot, what they think of it, because it is mm. there is a charm to it. And, and I think for me, with animated films, not that I'm going and saying this has got to be of this quality, like X, Y, and Z. I prefer animated films to sort of charm me, to maybe move you, to have a profound impact, and also be the why isn't the, why can't this be done in live action? It's such a horrible question for me to ask because a lot of them obviously could. I know there's like creative standpoints, but I think this would have been better in animated in comparison to live action. I I think if you do Tintin as live action, you just you're just gonna end up with young Indiana Jones. And I, I don't think yes. that would translate to audiences as well. You also need to find a round faced ginger boy to play the part of Tintin, which could be difficult to be fair. Um Rupert but... Grinton twenty years ago. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. Um, no, um, final thoughts on it. I found the film to be quite messy. And that's really on the kind of the story point of view. And I also found the animation to be very uncanny valley, not quite almost too polished and kind of not quite there. Very close attempts, but not quite there. So overall, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of the film, but I can understand why people would be attracted to it. I can understand why people can kind of look past those things and everything like that yeah. and enjoy the film itself. Um, I guess we'll have to see if the sequel comes out to see whether they iron out those different things, because if they do, then they've got themselves not only a, a, a second film, a feature film, another great animated film, but they've possibly got themselves a good franchise on their hands. There's so many Tintin comics. You've got so much material to pull from. You can absolutely take that forwards and go wherever you wanted to with it. No, 100%. And I said, also, we didn't mention it, this is an expensive anime film, 170 million oh, yeah, in 2011. So that's... <laughs> And again, it's that technology is then pushing new ideas, and I think that's something that can always be appreciated, even if it doesn't have that sort of final kick. Um, but with that in mind, we're going to hand over to everybody at home. Please do comment your thoughts on Tin the adventures of Tintin, sorry. And as always, don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. We're phew, episode 27 out of 34. We're like almost there. the way there. Yeah, like it's it's flown by. But again, to be in the tens, you know, before we're talking about pushing the, the, the you know, pushing cinema forward in the 80s of what business and I like pushing tech forward in the 10s. It's been a pretty insane journey. And uh, if you are curious about what does come next, we've mentioned it a few times tonight. The next film is going to be War Horse on the schedule. That's going to go up on Tuesday, the 4th of October. Do join us for that. We'll have another guest on as well. And that's going to be quite an exciting one. That's a, that's a low key. A lot of people mm. enjoy that film. It doesn't get spoken about as much now, but that was a very, very big film and was successful. So, do check that out and uh, before we get into the socials i'm just going to very quickly bring up the, the the sort of the coming scene map as we will so you mentioned we've got war horse next week aside from that we've also got lincoln coming on the 11th of october a bridge of spies on the 18th three sort of heavyweights back to back to back and then we're going to go back into the uncanny valley of the bfg mm. um i've never seen the bfg um, but if Neither anyone is I. <laughs> curious, I believe it's like one of our like most viewed reviews on the channel ever so, or something. I don't know if it's mm. been one of them where it's been like embedded in another country and we think it's the full film. But um, I'm quite excited for that because Mike Ryan's pops up and becomes a Spielberg advocate on the spot. Um, so yeah, there's a we're, we're heading as we're getting closer and closer. That that takes we've got a few more. Uh, it is getting quicker. As we mentioned, Fableman's is is, is on the circuit festival, just unfortunately in the United Kingdom. Uh, but obviously, if we do get a chance to see that early, we will be like. Prob I mean, is it is it fair for us to? We can probably announce it now. We know it's not at the festival. Yeah. Um, we're going to drop the top ten ranking video the week after West Side Story, which will be in November. Uh, it's way too soon to sort of push it out there for people to have a look at. Um, but we will obviously have a Fableman's episode when we get it in the United Kingdom when we get to see it. But obviously, the downside of that is that we can't talk about its legacy, its box office, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Probably don't do that on the Oscar Sunday, if we're being honest. That like that will like mark a year if it's as good as what people uh, are hoping it is. This retrospective might actually end at the Oscars it, to a weird point. Um, mm. But aside from that, Tate, where can everybody find us at home to find out about this? If we did get to see it early, where would we tell everyone we'd be seeing it early? We would tell everyone on Twitter and Instagram. Those are our most active places, so that's kind of where we'd immediately go to. Uh, find us there at cinema underscore savvy. You can also find us on Facebook and on Letterboxd. Just type in cinema savvy as well. Or go into the link in the description and pick up a t-shirt or a jumper or whatever you want to at the Redbubble store and help out our channel further. Definitely. So everybody, please do that. And we've got a few other things to plug. We're in the end of September now. We've mentioned there's a lot of James Bond stuff happening. It's the anniversary. That More details will be on our socials. There's a few Bond videos coming out. We're working on behind the scenes. We've also got the London Film Festival starting next Wednesday, the 5th of October. That's going to be massive for us. That'll be our fourth, fifth year in a row. Fifth year I've been, I think, fourth year we've covered it on the channel. Mm. Um, and obviously, any videos we do will pop up throughout that festival. It might be on Twitter. If we're lucky, interviews. If we're even lucky, or red carpets. We don't know. We don't know what will happen. But we know we're going to be there for a decent amount of it. So please do join us in getting, you know, we're very fortunate to see some of those films and maybe get us on socials there's a lot of people that's been on this series we'll be seeing in person uh so th there might be some actual nice behind the scenes of everyone meeting up for a change and if you're not a fan of the the sort of festival circus if you want your, your big blockbusters 
Uh, we've got uh, Andor discussions happening every Wednesday, so you can come join us. By the time this video goes up, I believe episode four will be out tomorrow. So I'd imagine there'll be a spoiler discussion on the, the night. Haven't confirmed times for how we're going to run that series yet. But um, yeah, you'll know it will be on our socials and we'll, we'll make sure that is addressed to everybody. So every Wednesday and or sports discussions. I think that's everything we can plug. We're moving into one of the busiest parts of the year, as we keep saying. Um, and as always, we're going to thank everybody that's stuck around with us, that's been on these videos, that's been watching this, that's been checking out some of our newest. We've had a lot of TV. We've got more TV coming. Um, but it is nice to talk about films and, and we're going to get that at the festival. So once again, thank you all for watching and be sure to join us on the next one. Take care.